Good morning to all the participants of the uh, to the sixth congress of young pediatricians and uh, it is a particular pleasure for me uh, to chair this session which is dedicated to the impact that the recent pandemic by covid-19 uh, produced on the you know on uh, on uh, an important part of the healthcare which is represented by uh, the residents uh, residents are often, um, let, let's, let me say, disregarded in the uh, medical environment uh, as uh, a part that uh, should be silent and just uh, uh, observe rules and obey to uh, the indication by, by, their, by their chief. In reality, uh, they carry uh, a lot of the job that is performed in the in the hospital. So it is really important, uh, and I thank the organizers for for their for their um, for their idea to uh, to dedicate the session specifically uh, to the to the problems, and many problems that the uh, residents have faced during this difficult year uh, of pandemic. Um, and lastly. And now that uh, we have, uh, they carry the first impact, but also the consequences uh, and uh, and the future, because now that we have available the vaccine, hopefully, uh, throughout uh, our countries, uh, perhaps uh, I understand in, in some country, uh, the vaccine is uh, more available than in the others, you know, and, uh, and uh, but this is, you know, a topic that, could be discussed by the by the speakers, but uh, uh, um, residents are also called now uh, to carry the uh, um, the vaccination as a, you know as a, um, administrators of this uh, this uh, uh, preventive means. So they 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 are called uh, frequently to to be the you know to support the. Uh, the uh, healthcare practice in uh, in uh, and uh, and sometimes this may may produce some some difficulty in uh, in attending their their studies uh, uh, properly. So so there are many implications that will be discussed in uh, in this important session. And uh, um, just for you know for uh, the the few announcement. Uh, to the practical organization of this of this session uh, uh, referred to the fact that I'm chairing the session but uh, and I will introduce the speakers uh, but I believe that at the end uh, the uh, questions from the from the attendees uh, will be handled uh, by uh, one of the residents uh, organizers uh, in particular by by Dr. Merich, Ria Merich, uh, that will uh, um, manage the discussion uh, usefully. I think it's, uh, it's more appropriate if a resident would manage the discussion. So we can start uh, with the first presentation. Ah, very importantly, the presentation are, you know, will provide us an overview uh, from different countries, from different local realities, uh, different uh, uh, medical backgrounds, and uh, um, in terms of organization of the healthcare in Europe. We, Europe is characterized by very different uh, um, uh, social and, uh, and health backgrounds. So, so I think it would be important for the for the participants to 
to uh, listen and to know uh, the voice uh, of residents from different parts of Europe. We, we can start from the from Turkey, and the first the first speaker will be uh, Dr. Meric, Dr. Meric from Turkey, and uh, I kindly ask Dr. Meric to start her presentation, and I thank in advance for her contribution. Thank you, Professor Massimo. I'm sharing my screen now. Um, I would like to thank EPA President Professor Massimo for being the chair for our first online Young European Young Pediatricians Association. Um, dear colleagues, welcome all. I'm Ria, EPA President. I would like to give you a quick information on who we are first. Uh, we are a scientific association. We aim to support the efforts of new young pediatricians, and we try to share our experience on education and research. Uh, we are formed under the umbrella of EPA UNEPSA during a combined conference in Padua, January 2015, between Italian and Turkish pediatric associations. Uh, since then, we had six meetings, two Europa sessions. This is our third Europa session and the Congress. Uh, we accept as members medical doctors in pediatric training and pediatricians within five, year, five years of completion of residency. Uh, this is our website. Uh, to become a member, you can fill in our member application form found in our website, or you can just email us. We have uh, now 13 representatives from different EPA and EPSA member countries, but we try to gain more members and expand. This is our executive board represented by seven pediatricians from different countries. And during a uh, fifth Turkish Young Pediatrician Congress in 2019, we had a Europa session where we talked about the diversity of our pediatric residency programs. And about that session, we had two editorials published in the Journal of Pediatrics. As similar to our last session, this time also we will try to combine the same subject with different perspectives. Today, we would like to share our experiences on coronavirus. You will hear from eight different countries, and we will try to explain how we approach the COVID and how our pediatric residency programs were affected. I will start with Turkey. Our index case was seen on 11th of March 2020, as our Minister of Health declared, although many experts claim it was way before. Uh, every day in the news, we get a table like this. Uh, we get to see the total number of tests, total number of patients, number of deaths, and number of critically ill patients, and number of recoveries. This is total numbers until February. Keeping in mind that Turkey's population is 84 million people, we almost have 2.5 million cases and uh, 26,000 deaths. When we look at the world data, Turkey has the ninth place in terms of total case numbers. This is a map showing the uh, number of deaths of healthcare providers in different countries. As you can see, Mexico has the uh, largest number and followed by United States and Russia, which we will hear from later today. And Turkey has uh, somewhere below than them. In Turkey, uh, we had more than 120,000 uh, healthcare providers who got infected. Uh, it's almost one in every 10 corona case. And unfortunately, we had 216 deaths. And an interesting statistic is that more than 4,500 4, healthcare providers resigned only last year. So these are some examples of our government precautions during last year. We had general curfew during 9 p.m. and 5 a.m., uh, also weekends and holidays. Um, we had funerals and weddings only with 30 people. Uh, restaurants only provide a takeaway service, interstate travels required permission, international flights terminated, annual leaves of healthcare providers stopped uh, from March 2020 until February 2021. All schools were closed, online education started, and we had penalty for going out without a mask, and cinemas, theaters, concert halls were all closed, and all hospitals in Turkey accepted COVID patients. Um, 
this is maybe, you know, at uh, Atatürk International Airport, which was not in the use at the time and became an emergency hospital with 1000 bed capacity. Its name comes from uh, an internal medicine professor who worked at Istanbul University, fought and lost to COVID at the age of 78, unfortunately. Uh, this is um, news, a COVID risk map of Turkey. It was declared on uh, 1st of March. And as you can see, um, the cities are divided into risk uh, categories. All primary schools and kindergartens were opened and a general curfew during 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. continued. In blue and yellow cities where the numbers are less, restaurants and cafes were opened. And in all cities beside red ones, the curfew during weekends got lifted. And we had, a, uh, our government had a campaign called Life Fits Into Home, meaning if possible, stay at home. But like all the other countries, this affected the craftsmen and shopkeepers really badly since they earn money daily. By using this application, um, you can see the risky, the COVID risk of the area. And if you had a risky contact, the affiliation team would track you and keep you in quarantine. And you have to take a QR code in order to travel or go to a cafe. Uh, although it's, a good, it's good for the government to find the risky contact easily, this is also violating personal privacy. You are always being tracked wherever you go. And this is our treatment protocol. Our Ministry of Health declared treatment protocol uh, for children with COVID infection. It was updated lastly in September, 2020. As you can see, this is our treatment for uh, severe pneumonia. Our first uh, drug of choice for children is hydroxychloroquine for five days. And the alternative is lopinavir ritonavir tablet for 10 to 14 days. And uh, if the patient is more than 15 years old, uh, Fovipravir is recommended by the Coronavirus Science Board of our government. And for the vaccine, we used CoronaVac, and the first uh, person to be vaccinated was our Minister of Health, as you can see in the photo. After him, healthcare workers were vaccinated. Uh, this is a map of Turkey showing the numbers of vaccinated people, almost 10 million people so far. In our clinic, we had 20 inpatient treatments. Uh, the median age was 10. Uh, we had 45 ICU cases, including multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Uh, we had COVID positive mothers, but not newborns. And luckily we didn't have any COVID related deaths. So this is a photo of our uh, isolation room for inpatients. This is our sample taking unit in the ER. How our pediatric residency got affected? Uh, besides our clinic, lots of pediatric residents had to work at adult clinics, adult COVID clinics and wards with all the other residents. And in surgical residencies, all elective surgeries were canceled. So they had to work in the emergency COVID outpatient clinics and inpatient clinics. And residents and specialists who work in the COVID got paid extra according to their shifts for three months. Uh, for our curriculum, um, for pediatricians, work hours increased since no other residents could cover pediatric emergency, ICU, and neonatal ICU. For surgery residents, work hours and education decreased since they couldn't do any surgeries, they had only emergency. Uh, almost all residents had to extend the time of their residency by three to six months, unfortunately. And for the last year, we had e-learning and online congresses. These are some examples of e-learning and online congresses we had. And I would like to thank for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Merich. Very interesting information. And uh, I was pleased to see that one, uh, about one eighth, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, one eighth of uh, the population has been already vaccinated, right? Yes, yes, we have with the contribution of residents, by the way, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we um, now I invite the, the second speaker, Dr. Stone, Gavin Stone from Ireland, uh, to give his presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Stone. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Roya. Um, today, I would like to talk about the effects of um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, on paediatric residency in Ireland. 
Uh, the pandemic started in Ireland. Um, we saw our first case of COVID-19 on the 29th of February 2020. Um, before this, we had set up the National Public Health Emergency Team on the 27th of January. Shortly after, on the 12th of March, um, with increasing COVID numbers, um, we had our first lockdown. Uh, here, there was mandatory closures of schools, childcare facilities and the hospitality sector. Ten days later, um, we had COVID-19 in all uh, counties in Ireland. And then on the 27th of March, we had our first mandatory stay at home order. To date, as of Friday, um, we've had 222,169 cases on the island of Ireland. That's 4.5% of the total uh, population of the Republic. We have had 4,405 deaths. Um, in total, we've given uh, nearly half a million vaccines. Um, 4.7% um, of the total of the population of Ireland have been vaccinated. Um, 26,225 healthcare workers have been infected and unfortunately 12 health healthcare workers have died. We're currently in the midst of our third uh, wave of the infection. Um, on the 11th of January, we have the highest incidence in the world of COVID-19 at 1,394 cases per million. Currently, we're at 106 cases per million, um, the equivalent of 522 cases per day. Um, COVID-19 has had a severe uh, impact on um, pediatric services in Ireland, and there's been significant disruptions. Um, of the three uh, main pediatric hospitals that we have in our capital city, Dublin, uh, one closed in order to allow a capacity for adult patients, um, including the um, 24 isolation rooms um, in that unit. And the services from this pediatric hospital were relocated into our other two hospitals in Crumlin and in Temple Street. Um, this relocation lasted a total of six months. And since September um, 2020, pediatric services have been um, reopened back in Tallaght University Hospital. Our service capacity has decreased for both inpatients and outpatients due to the need for physical distancing and due to um, uh, difficulties with uh, staff. Face-to-face um, -face, um, outpatients have, are now being re-established. Um, infrastructure for telemedicine took a long while to get up and running. And due to social distancing and public health precautions, uh, we did not see the annual surge in respiratory viruses this winter. When the evidence base became clear that it was safe for children to go back to school, uh, there was a lot of fear and hesitancy amongst the parents of children, um, especially those with chronic respiratory conditions like cystic fibrosis. Considerable work has gone into reassuring families that it's safe um, to send children back to school, and this has been highlighted as a national priority. The National Children's um, Hospital Project um, was already behind schedule prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, we had an anticipated uh, date of completion of construction at the end of 2022. Now this has been pushed back to 2024. Uh, cost inflation has been a huge issue uh, with this project. Um, it is now promising to be the most expensive hospital in the world. Um, costs have spiraled uh, from the 800 million um, it was forecasted to cost in 2014 and is now an estimated 1.73 billion. Um, school immunization programs have been suspended um, this was due to the COVID lockdown um, and there's uh, significant difficulties now in dealing with the backlog of cases. The move to online education um, has been difficult for a lot of paediatric residents, especially those beginning um, their paediatric training and um, who haven't had the opportunity yet to develop relationships with their colleagues. Um, our exams, we have three paediatric residency exams, uh, two are written, one is clinical. The two written exams have both moved online and there's been a lot of work has gone into organizing these. Um, the clinical exams, there was necessary delays. We were unable to um, hold these clinical exams during the highest level five of um, lockdown in Ireland. And there's been, while we have managed to run two cycles of the clinical exams um, since coming out of level five lockdown, uh, there's still a significant backlog of people be, um, who still need to sit it because of the decreased capacity we have for organising it. Um, COVID-19 related absences have been a huge issue for um, healthcare in Ireland. Um, at the peak of the third wave, almost 6,400 uh, healthcare staff were off work um, as a result of COVID-19 and um, COVID-19 contact precautions. Our leave was cancelled. Um, we had, un unfortunately, unlike Turkey, we didn't have any increase in our pay um, due to the risk that we were uh, dealing with. 
our shifts. Um, while we didn't have an increased number of shifts, the intensity of work that we had to um, deal with during our shifts was increased. Um, oftentimes we would have had to work increased call shifts. However, this would have been sporadic. Um, different units were different, uh, had different levels of impact, especially smaller tertiary uh, pediatric centres um, outside of our uh, main capital city. Um, were very severely affected uh, because of the decreased numbers on their rotas. Um, the relocation of uh, services from Tala to Cromlin and Temple Street caused a different uh, pediatric residency experience than a lot of our pediatric residents uh, were affecting, um, they were expecting, sorry. Um, and as there was um, issues with relocation of staff. While a lot of paediatric trainees were not reallocated to paediatric services, a lot of people would have done volunteer work um, at the weekends, I suppose, with, they've been enrolled in vaccination programs and um, with the National Ambulance Service and triaging calls. Um, and this was related services, so paediatric intensive care units, adult um, anaesthetic trainees who would have been rotating through uh, the paediatrics department got pulled back to adult hospitals. Um, and a lot of emergency department trainees would have gone back to adult um, hospitals as well. Um, thank you very much for uh, having me to speak today. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Son. You really presented very interesting data that touched uh, many hot topics uh, implicating the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic uh, that I, pro I, I, I believe that would be uh, very much discussed at the end uh, from the impact on the slowing down the facilities, the hospitals facilities in countries, um, a disruption in the immunization schedule, uh, an impact uh, on the education, uh, and and shows a difference in uh, in pay, uh, you know, among the the, the countries uh, for for residents. So, so very very interesting presentation. I thank you very much, and uh, and uh, I I kindly ask the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Dmitry Slatkov uh, from Russia to give his presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So now I will share my screen. I hope you can see it clearly. First of all, I would like to thank you, Professor Massimo and Ruya, for inviting me to participate in this uh, conference, in this meeting. And today I would like to tell you about uh, COVID-19 pandemic, or is it called now syndemic, and its impact on uh, Russian Federation and on our citizens. First of all, some uh, general information. First two cases of coronavirus uh, were revealed on uh, January 31st uh, in last year. It was to citizens of China. As you know, Russia and China, we have um, huge connections in educational programs. So we have many students from China coming to our universities. And that's why those two cases were from the China Day citizens. But nevertheless, both of them were and had a mild course of disease and they were administrated in the hospitals. And after the treatment, after 10 and 12 days, they were discharged from the hospital. Uh, according to the data on uh, February 15, total number of cases in Russia were almost 4 million and 100 cases, uh, and the 3 million 600 uh, thousand cases of recovered patients. Mortality rate was uh, 80 thousand, and uh, according to the implemented vaccination from uh, 5th of December of last uh, year, we almost uh, injected uh, 4 million uh, doses of vaccine. But you should understand that uh, our vaccine is um, two component. So you should uh, uh, divide this number by two so, uh, to understand the actual number of patients who received the vaccination. And during the 2020, we have performed uh, uh, 17 million uh, 800,000 tests. And this, all the data is actual for mid, middle of February. According to health workers, uh, as um, according to the unofficial data, we have uh, almost uh, 70,000 uh, infected health workers and more than 1,000 uh, lethal cases. It's a um, very huge amount of uh, workers, uh, as you can see. 
here on this slide, you can see um, the two major waves and peaks which we had in last year. So the first one uh, was in the end of May when we had almost uh, 11 and a half uh, thousand cases uh, per day in the whole country. And the next one, uh, second peak was at the end of December when we have almost 30,000 new cases per day in, one, in, in our country. And then you can see two declines and they all connect to the governmental precautions in May and the uh, implementation of vaccination in the beginning of December. So the second decline is connected with, this, with vaccination. And now, according to the data, um, Russia is in the fourth place uh, of um, infected cases uh, among other countries in the world. So here you can see the list of government precautions and measures. So the first one was um, closing of uh, airway and uh, railway connections um, between uh, neighbor countries and other countries. Uh, we first closed flight connection, connections with China and later with other countries. And on April the 4th, uh, our government uh, closed the borders. So even Russian citizens couldn't um, return from other countries if they been there on vacation or on some work trips, for example. So they should stay in the country where they've been during the past uh, several, for example, weeks. Universities and uh, schools uh, started distant form of education from March 16th, and uh, they continue such a distant form of education until um, the end of the semester, so until end of June. And uh, in the September, in the beginning of September, new educational year, the students and the uh, and pupils and schools started the um, normal offline form of education, but nevertheless, by the end of September, they again uh, went to the distant form because of the risk of the second wave of coronavirus in Russian Federation. Uh, the total lockdown started in Russia on March 30th, uh, and uh, it uh, lasted strictly until uh, May 11th, so only social workers and medical workers were able to go outside for the jobs, so and others were restricted to go outside without masks, uh, without uh, special equipment, and uh, going too far away from the houses. So masks and gloves were strictly important in uh, shops, in uh, public transport, and in our, for example, hospitals. And in case if the person uh, uh, don't didn't wear it, it was fines and penalties. And uh, our government was very strict about the penalties itself. According to the treatment, uh, you can see that um, our hospitals were reassigned for working with COVID-19 positive patients. We had these patients in uh, mostly now infectious diseases uh, departments. And uh, also we have uh, built uh, several hospitals very fast, like in China, our, neighbor, like our, our colleagues in China, they built the hospital like in uh, three weeks. We wasn't so fast, but we also prepared this more beds for these patients. And uh, according to the child healthcare, we have in Moscow we have uh, two ghost hospitals which are working with COVID-19 positive uh, children. But uh, the amount of total cases of children were really low. So here you can see the red zone how the doctors uh, were preparing for work, and. Um, Mm, we have stopped uh, planned uh, hospitalization. Uh, we performed only emergency care uh, for our patients. And of course, the Minister of Health, uh, with uh, our Union of Pediatricians uh, of Russia, with Professor Namazov Barano, they have uh, prepared and uh, developed uh, guidelines for treatment of children during the COVID 19 pandemic. And of course, we were working according to the experience and ideas of our foreign colleagues. Then, uh, I think uh, all of you know, but uh, our country have developed uh, several vaccines. And uh, here you can see two of them. The first one is uh, Sputnik V. It's adenovirus viral two vector vaccine and Epivac Corona. It's peptide and genes based vaccine but it's still um, under all the juridical legislations. Now, the second one is not on the market yet, but the first one, Sputnik V, we are performing vaccination from the beginning of December 2020, and the Russian authorities announced the start of large-scale free vaccination 
with uh, Sputnik V for all the citizens. First of all, uh, they started vaccinate, vaccination for doctors, for medical staff, for social workers and for teachers. So the, for the first line uh, people who are working with other people with children. And uh, now the interest in these vaccines are growing uh, in our neighbors countries, but still there are some precautions so we should be applied, of course, like in the other vaccination from other countries. And nowadays uh, our doctors, our scientists are working on the third vaccine uh, from also from Moscow, but it's still uh, under reviews and the research. So it will be maybe later this year, it will be ready. So what are the impact of uh, coronavirus infection on residents? In almost all spheres of medical education, our residents uh, went on offline form of education. And uh, only this one who volunteered, they went to work in uh, hospitals with uh, coronavirus infection patients. So pediatricians, uh, pediatric surgeons, uh, general practitioners, they went uh, only voluntarily. So it wasn't, uh, uh, they weren't asked for it mandatory, only by the will, of course. And um, others, uh, others residents, they continue the study in online form and passing the exams, as Gavin mentioned, also online. And uh, you know, we have um, general uh, national exams uh, in the end of uh, residency. And it was delayed, it was postponed from the end of uh, educational year to the beginning of autumn. Then uh, also our government uh, had uh, announced the extra additional payment and for health workers, uh, both for these volunteers residents as well and for general practitioners. But as I know, the, because of our countries, Big, you know, there were several problems with uh, its implementation in some regions. But anyway, these extra payments were discharged for all the involved workers. About curriculum changes in hospitals, I can say that uh, because we delayed all the planned hospitalization and working with only emergency care patients, uh, of course, uh, our general work has changed, but uh, working hours stay the same. Those doctors who work with COVID-19 patients, they work in uh, with shifts, so like, like uh, 24 hour shifts or 12 hour shifts. And so what's next? Uh, I think it's difficult questions. Uh, nowadays, all of us are thinking about third wave of coronavirus infection, but we don't know would it be in spring, in uh, summer. And uh, we are forcing uh, uh, patients and other people to perform vaccination. I think this is it. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. And again, thank you for inviting me to participate in this conference. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zlatkov. Uh, and thank you uh, also to you for having introduced uh, other elements uh, useful to the, to the discussion that will take place at the end. You, uh, by the way, you, you introduce uh, any very interesting information about the second vaccine. Uh, we knew about Sputnik, but uh, personally didn't know uh, much about the, uh, the second vaccine that has not been uh, uh, yet uh, uh, circulated in, uh, uh, for the, and distributed like the, the Epi, Epivac uh, yeah. Coron, right? as an antigen-based vaccine. Very interesting information and and uh, probably we will uh, listen in the future about uh, listen more in the future about this vaccine and uh, and uh, and again you you emphasize many uh, many of the issues that uh, that has been discussed by your by the previous speakers and uh, uh, including you know their redirection to other duties uh, <laughs> uh, uh, of the residents uh, from from the from the typical uh, curricula that they were usually following uh, in their in their education and and uh, and again no salary supplement uh, uh, although promised right <laughs> as probably happened in uh, in other countries i guess including italy 
and uh, talking about Italy, the next speaker, and I thank you very much, Dr. Slavkov, again, for your presentation, and, and talking about Italy, the next speaker will be Dr. Manka, Enrico Manka, uh, representing the um, uh, Resident Association uh, uh, of uh, Italy, and I ask kindly Dr. Manka to, uh, to give her presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor. I'm going to share my video. Okay. So I will talk um, about the pandemic effects on pediatric residency in Italy. Uh, I just uh, start with uh, an overview of the uh, COVID-19 timeline. We all know that on the 21st of December 2019, the first cluster of pneumonia of a known origin was described in China, in Wuhan, and started the uh, epidemic. Then, a week later, this new virus member of the coronavirus virus family was uh, isolated and sequenced in a patient in Wuhan. Um, a few days later, there was the first death in China. And it was a 61-year-old man who had been shopping in Wuhan. On the 10th, uh, 13th of January, the WHO reported also the first case outside China, in China, in Thailand. And uh, it was uh, also a woman coming from Wuhan. At the end of uh, January, we had the first two cases in Italy. They were two tourists uh, uh, from China positive to the virus. Um, and uh, on the 21st of February, we had the first index patient in Italy near Milan. So almost uh, two weeks later, we had uh, the uh, national lockdown. And a few days later, the World Health Organization declared the uh, pandemic status. Uh, so the number of uh, COVID uh, infected people in Italy is very high. Uh, up until the end of the month of February, we had almost 3 million people infected of COVID, of which 90, almost 98,000 of people uh, were dead. Uh, we also had a lot of cases among health workers. In fact, up until the end of February, Almost uh, 124,000 uh, people, health workers, were infected, and we had uh, almost 500 deaths, of which 30, 332 were doctors. Um, moreover, we also uh, know that uh, uh, to the end of February, uh, at the end of February, on the 28th of February, we had 122,000 people currently positive. So during last year, our government took a lot of precaution in order to uh, stop the spreading of this infection. First of all, we had the national lockdown on the uh, 8th of March, 2020. So a person in order to leave home uh, had uh, to have health problems, work, uh, necessity reasons such as courses or jogging, or they can move just in order to return to their residency home associated with a 14 days quarantine. In addition, all face masks were mandatory in all public places. Um, in the middle of May, um, due to the, um, uh, the, the low number, to the decrease of number of uh, infected people, our government allowed the movement inside each region and reopened um, bars, restaurants, hairdressers and other uh, activities. And uh, a few days, uh, two weeks later, uh, they also allowed movement between different regions and they opened also the uh, border between uh, with the European Union and the Schengen area associated countries associated uh, with the 14 days quarantine in this case. 
Um, at the beginning of November, however, we had a second peak of uh, infected people. And for these reasons, the government introduced a declassification of Italian regions uh, based on colors, yellow for low risk, orange for medium risk, and red for high risk. Each region was associated or each color was associated with uh, uh, some precautions. In yellow regions, we had the curfew at uh, uh, 10 o'clock in the evening. All museums and expositions are closed. High school scholars had uh, uh, started the, the online education, uh, whereas elementary and middle schoolers uh, had to wear masks uh, at school. All malls were closed during holidays, and uh, uh, we have the 50% capacity uh, on public buses. On the, uh, in orange regions, in addition to what we have in the yellow regions, uh, a person is not allowed to enter or exit from the region, and he is not allowed to move outside the town. All bars, pubs, and restaurants are closed. Gymnasium also are closed, and sportive activities are forbidden. Um, elementary scholars have to wear masks at school, and in this case, along with high school scholars, also middle scholars have uh, the online education program. In red regions, uh, the uh, precautions are more strict. In fact, uh, in addition to what we have in orange regions, in these kind of regions, um, all kinds of movements are forbidden. It's like a uh, curfew, in fact. Uh, the clinical syndromes associated with COVID-19 in children uh, were defined in Italy adapting to the WHO classification. So we have the asymptomatic case uh, identified during the screening or contract tracing and uh, who does not have symptoms and requires no treatment. We have the mild case uh, that identifies a person with a child with fever, fatigue or other AOA symptoms without radiological or ultrasound findings, uh, who required only antipyretic therapy. The moderate case is a child with fever or fatigue or upper airway symptoms or poor feeding or pneumonia, identified with chest X-ray or ultrasound, who required antipyretic therapy, airway suction in case of obstruction, low flow nasal oxygen if the oxygen saturation is below 95%, and intravenous access for adequate fluid and caloric intake in case of uh, dehydration or denutrition. In the severe case, we have a child with fever and cough, uh, plus at least one of the following uh, that are the oxygen saturation below 92%, severe respiratory distress, fast breathing, or systemic symptoms. In this case, we, uh, this, in this children require the antiparatic therapy, the airway suction in case of obstruction, the low flow nasal oxygen or high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation in some cases where, where needed, the intravenous access for uh, the um, fluid and caloric intake. In these cases, uh, um, they also require, these children require the uh, remdesivir and if it's not available, the hydroxychloroquine or lopinavir or ritonavir. The WHO uh, also suggested to avoid the empiric antibiotic treatment and consider immunomodulation through methylprednisolone or interleukin inhibitors, and consider also the prevention of uh, venous thromboembolism through a low local weight uh, heparin. The 27th of December 2020 is a very important day in Italy because it's uh, the first day of vaccination. And this person that you see is the first uh, person vaccinated in Italy. It's the first uh, nurse, it was a nurse in Rome. From this, day, uh, from this day on, all populations started to get vaccination. First of all, health workers and people living or walking in homes from the elderly. Then, from the 22nd of February 2021, the vaccination was uh, extended also to elderly people of more than eight years old, teachers and law enforcement. 
and after up until now we have more than one million people vaccinated. Uh, this pandemic uh, uh, changed uh, all the health assistance uh, organization. In fact, non-urgent procedures were postponed, medical appointments uh, were organized through uh, telemedicine, and the accesses to hospital were extremely reduced, uh, with 90% less than in 2019, both in uh, uh, emergency rooms than in the uh, ambulatory uh, accesses. And uh, in Italy, uh, during this last year, last year and second last year residents, but also retired doctors, were recruited in hospitals uh, due to the lack of personnel in the yard. Um, the uh, training program for pediatric residents also changed uh, in order to adapt uh, to this uh, scenery. In fact, uh, no more lessons or congresses or exams uh, or research activities and periods of training at a different uh, university were allowed. And uh, uh, where possible, these activities were performed uh, uh, online. In addition, we performed a survey among all pediatric uh, universities, and we found that 74% of these universities reduced their training activities. 69% used online lessons. 61 had at least one resident who contracted the virus. 55% uh, had residents who worked in pediatric med departments for infected uh, children. Uh, but we also had 10% uh, of pediatric residents who work in departments for infected adults. Uh, in addition, 40% of uh, pediatric universities used their residents for the management of chronic pediatric uh, patients through the telemedicine. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Manka, and uh, you certainly did add uh, important information, and, uh, and your contribution was uh, was very was very interesting, um, including, for instance, the uh, the report on the government precautions, uh, for instance, the Italian uh, colorful uh, approach to the pandemic control, right? That. Uh, uh, was used with the red, uh, yellow, and orange uh, type of uh, of uh, color of the re different regions. And uh, uh, another important uh, uh, point that you debated was certainly the uh, the emphasis of uh, no training, uh, although the residents were called to uh, be heavily involved in the pandemic control but uh, not probably and you will discuss this probably in uh, in uh, at the end of the session but no sufficient uh, apparently no sufficient training was uh, provided uh, in order for for them to be fully fully besides of course the uh, the residents in uh, in uh, in infectious diseases which we presume they had uh, background information and uh, and training, but uh, for the others, uh, uh, probably the, there is a lack that you will debate. So thank you very much again for your for your presentation. And uh, and uh, as uh, Dr. Zlatkov, uh, you know, pointed out, what's next? And the next uh, speaker would be uh, Dr. Zlobodanak, uh, Maria Zlobodanak from Croatia. And I ask kindly. Dr. Slovodanak to, to give her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Massimo. Greetings to everyone who's listening at the moment. I will share my screen now. Just a minute. Ah, here it is. So for those who don't know me, my name is Maria Slobodjanac. Uh, I am the final year uh, resident from Croatia. And uh, I'm going to talk about pandemic effects on pediatric residency program in my country. Uh, first, I will start with some general information about COVID-19. Uh, today, uh, world population counts around 7.8 billion people, uh, while my country, according to the last census that was in uh, 2011, has around 4 million people. 
as we all know, virus uh, causing COVID-19 disease started um, in uh, Wuhan, China. Actually, it was detected there on uh, 29 December 2019. And after that, it was detected around the world. The first case was in Croatia on 25th February 2020. Um, since then, a year after, on 25th February 2021, uh, the situation in the world uh, is uh, over one, uh, 116 million infected, over 65 million recovered, and over 2.5 uh, million deceased. In Croatia, the situation is to over 240,000 infected, 230,000 recovered, and over 4,000 deceased. Uh, if we look at Croatia, we cope well with pandemic, having only one major wave in December and uh, November and December 2020, with the um, highest infected number on, I think it was uh, 10 December 2020, with little over 4,500 infected people per day. So what did our government do? They announced first lockdown at March 2020 when COVID-19 pandemic started. It was widely regarded as one of the strictest and most rigorous in Europe. At that time, we had less than 100 persons per day infected, and indeed, uh, it provided effective. After that started summertime and the end of first lockdown. There were weekly changes regarding uh, the restriction of public and personal gatherings, uh, travel limitation inside and outside of country, schools, restaurants, and coffee bars were, clo were closed or reopening. Basic, uh, uh, everything changes, follow, uh, all changes follow dynamics of number of infected persons per day. Second lockdown came in November 2020. The number of infected persons took an abrupt ascending path. Uh, during that period, we had over 4,000 person infected per day. Today, we have less than uh, 600 per day. As we all know, some things have become commonplace, like social distance, face mask, and hand sanitizers have become mandatory in all public places, closed room, and public transportation. Here are some recommendations. I will not go through all of them because they are very similar uh, as are in your country. I would only say that uh, thanks to the good pandemic situation in my country, a few weeks ago, our government started uh, easing measures like um, kids are back to school, but wearing facial masks, uh, terraces of um, bars and restaurants are open, gyms are open. Um, wait, uh, yes. So at the beginning of pandemic, our government released a Stop COVID-19 mobile application. Uh, this app, which if it's installed, can potentially alert the user being in epidemiologically risky contact and give advice on further action. But, very, very big but, it has not been shown effective. Firstly, because um, most uh, majority of infected were older people who are not used to technology. Uh, also, uh, it didn't work on all mobile phones, and a uh, younger population uh, was uh, very um, concerned about their privacy. So, nothing else. How about health system in my country? Uh, like in all other countries, we have, uh, it was heavily affected, not just due to increased numbers of infected patients, but also because of infected personnel. I have um, uh, data uh, until the 16th February 2020, uh, we had over 2,600 infected medical doctors, including 131 pediatricians and 48 pediatric residents in training, and over 16,000 other medical staff. Uh, that includes uh, nurses, uh, other technicians, and uh, people who work in administrations. Furthermore, all health centers and hospitals have organized special points for sample collecting nasal swabs. Some even had it in forms of mobile teams or an organized drive through So in the next picture, you can see me. As you know, I said at the beginning of my presentation that I was final year pediatric residence and the last few months I work as a sample collecting for my uh, health center. 
Uh, on the next picture, you can see my colleague from Mostek. He's also a pediatrician. He works in a mobile team that goes uh, to the elderly population who couldn't come to specific points for collecting samples. Uh, on the last one, you can see my colleagues from Zagreb who works in um, a drive through uh, as the, due to the pandemic situation in the world, we prepared our local hospitals for worst scenarios. Some hospital like this one, that's clinical hospital Dubrava in Zagreb was transformed into COVID-19 center. Uh, this hospital accepted all infected persons, but uh, mostly worst cases. Some other hospitals like my hospital, clinical hospital Osiek, uh, transformed just parts of departments. But uh, we uh, also um, accepted all patients, not just uh, infected uh, with coronavirus. Uh, so how did pediatric curriculum was affected? On 15 March 2020, our government declared standby to all medical staff due to the pandemic situation. Because of that, we were forced to return to our home institutions. Many colleagues had to quit or postpone rotation in other clinics and departments like pediatric surgery, um, child uh, psychiatry, and so on. Uh, we were advised to limit contact with our family members and society to avoid infection and consequent advance uh, absence from work, which le leads in many uh, cases to depressions. Uh, we found ourselves in a situation where we had to work with adult patients in some departments because there was a lack of medical doctors due to COVID-19 disease and isolation, uh, which I have to say many colleagues said that it was very stressful. Most of medical staff is working overtime and still is working because we have many ship, more ships than usually. And uh, I have to say that our government declared that since November 2020, we will receive some kind of award like a salary supplement for working with COVID-19 patients, um, exact amount of money uh, we get depends on the amount of working hours spent with the infected. Uh, and it varies from 10 euros to 30 euros. Uh, like if you are um, anesthesiologist working in ICU, you will get 300 euros. But if you are primary pediatrician, you will get 10 euros per month. As I said before, due to the increased number of people fighting depression, burnouts, and panic attacks, our government decided to organize call centers. Uh, these centers offer uh, psychological help to all people who are interested and think they need help. And at last, vaccine. Uh, in December 2020, we started vaccination. It was first, firstly, it was offered to medical personnel and geriatric population in, in retirement homes. At the moment, we have three options that are circulating through our population. That's Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca. But we are having, uh, we face difficulties a bit uh, purchasing them. So our government start negotiation with Sputnik V from Russian Federation. Uh, and I would like to say that a few days ago, we started with general population. Also, according to the last numbers I got yesterday, we vaccinated only 60,000 people. And uh, the, those people received two shots for, from the vaccine. And uh, over 2,000 people received only one shot. So we are increasing number of vaccinated people. Uh, here are the picture of, pictures of um, vaccinating general population in sports hall. But there are lots of administrations, so vaccinate, vaccine process goes very slow. Uh, here are my colleagues from uh, COVID-19 uh, departments, uh, Daniel, Jelka, and Daniel. They are sending their love to you. And at last, I would like to all invite you uh, to the 10th Europediatrics that will be uh, held in hybrid form, uh, considering the global epidemiological situation. The event will physically take place at hotel, but will as well be live streamed. So you are all welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Slobodana. Uh, again, your presentation was very contributive and, uh, and I appreciated all the recommendations uh, because we need, you know, 
uh, uh, we need all, all the health uh, professional needs a uh, 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 living guidelines on you know, to, to particularly these guidelines could be uniform you know throughout the, the, the continent at least uh, yes. not throughout the world so it was very was very important and also how your country uh, prepare for the worst case scenario was also interesting to know. Um, one point uh, that probably will be discussed also, it was interesting for me to, to see the um, uh, official declaration of a standby. Yes. Uh, and uh, probably uh, could be interesting to see if the standby could be also interpreted as an educational standby. Uh, in the sense that you know, one year uh, of you know uh, uh, loss of edu education and uh, loss of curricula could be could be damaging for residents. So it could be a topic to discuss with to ask the government. Yes, we estimated that at least six months was uh, lost to this uh, in pediatric curriculum. So six months was prolonged. So I think. Okay, so so it it probably could be a good topic for discussion, for uh, later discussion, whether to ask to the government to declare a standby mm -hmm. in the curriculum yes. to, uh, and restart the curriculum where they were stopped. So thank you very much again thank for you. the presentation. And uh, we pass to uh, the next presentation, next speaker, which is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Palivu uh, from Maria Palivu from, uh, from Greece. And I kindly ask Dr. Priyo to, to give her presentation. Hello, thank you very much for having me. Now I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, Hello everyone, thank you very much for having me here. My name is uh, Maria Palivu. I'm a trainee uh, in the Department of Pediatrics of Medical School of University of Patras, Greece. Uh, Patras is uh, the first biggest town uh, in my country with a population of uh, uh, 100 um, million people, while the population of Greece uh, is approximately uh, 11 million. Uh, I've been working there since uh, January 2020, so I had the chance to see the evolution of COVID-19 before it even started in Greece. Uh, our patient zero was in Thalonica in February 2020. Uh, it was a woman who has just returned from a trip to Milan, Italy. Uh, while our first pediatric case in my department was in July 2020, it was a 10 years old girl. She was completely asymptomatic and she came to us as an outpatient because her mother was a confirmed COVID-19 victim. Uh, the first infected child in need of hospitalization uh, in Patras was in October. It was a 14 years old boy with a mild infection of respiratory system. So by the end of February 2021, the total number of COVID-19 patients uh, was about uh, 200,000 uh, people, uh, while 6,500 of them for unfortunately lost their lives because of the SARS-CoV-2. A little over half of them were men, while the greater majority were people over 65 years of age. Uh, only 0.2% of deaths were people under 17 years of age. About Greek government precautions, from March to May 2020, uh, the first lockdown took place in Greece. It was among uh, the strictest in Europe. It was really effective, as you can see there, with a very, very low number of deaths. And uh, actually, uh, during the summer, uh, the number of uh, new cases uh, um, was low, but unfortunately, people were not very careful. So uh, from November 2020 to January, a second lockdown took place, uh, which was less strict, as you can see there, <laughs> and less effective. Uh, and currently, a third lockdown is in effect. Uh, the town that I live in, Patras, is characterized as 
a deep red zone area from our epidemiologist. There is a map uh, of my country. You can see everything is red and deep red. Um, I live here. Also, our capital, Athens, uh, is uh, red, deep red. Uh, in Patras and other deep red zone areas, wearing masks is mandatory everywhere, indoors and outdoors. Our education institutions, our laser facilities, our galleries, museums are currently closed. We have a curfew from 6 p.m. to uh, 5 p.m. Uh, when citizens are outside their home, they have to carry official documentation with them or uh, send a text message explaining the reason for leaving uh, their homes. Uh, now, about how many people were infected from the health employees, uh, the numbers are not too bad. 14% uh, of COVID-19 cases were health workers. Uh, unfortunately, eight people lost uh, their lives because of SARS-CoV-2. And in my department, uh, two pediatric trainees uh, were infected by COVID, by SARS-CoV-2, uh, during the second wave of the pandemic. Um, most of our children uh, have uh, present mild symptoms, so their treatment is uh, symptomatic uh, with IV solutions or paracetamol for fever. Uh, when we have to deal with more serious cases such as pneumonia or ALTS, we administer remdesivir and corticosteroids. And when we have to deal with multisystem inflammatory syndrome associated COVID-19, uh, we use high immunoglobin, corticosteroids, aspirin, even anakinra, uh, low molecular weight different, and antibiotics if it's needed. So uh, in December 2020, uh, frontline health care staff, uh, the elderly people over age five years old and residents at nursing home started to get vaccinated with the Pfizer COVID-19 uh, vaccine with the mRNA technology. And in February 2021, people between 60 and 64 years old started to get vaccinated with the Oxford uh, vaccine. By the end of February, about uh, 1 million Greek citizens have been vaccinated. They have received at least uh, the first dose, and that's 7% uh, of our population. Uh, my department uh, has uh, hospitalized uh, from March 22 to February uh, 2020, I'm sorry, uh, 400 uh, children. Uh, 27 of them are confirmed cases. Uh, five of them uh, were really serious cases and they were transferred to our PICU. Uh, although uh, we had no tests at all and we really, really hope that if we continue this way. Uh, in my department, initially, we, we used to have two pediatric clinics, one PICU and one NICU. But uh, when the pandemic started, uh, the one pediatric clinic was transformed to COVID-19 department. Uh, this department has seven rooms. Five of them are used as uh, isolations. Uh, all of them have an entrance hall where we remove uh, our uniforms and we also have an extra room which is used as a changing room uh, and there is always a nurse there supervising the changing clothes process. Uh, also, a negative pressure room for COVID-19 cases was created for our PICU and we have a special room for COVID-19 neonates. Uh, where our working hours have not been affected that much, neither did our salaries. Uh, although, as you all already know, our, our shifts are way harder than they used to be. A lot of changes happened to our training curriculum. Now everybody has to go through a three-month training to COVID uh, clinic. Our lessons are online and we have a many presentation about new vaccines and new treatments. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you to you, uh, Dr. Pariu. Uh, I was pleased to see that, uh, you know, contrary to what I, I pointed out just before in your country, 
there is a training uh, a course indeed uh, three months if i if i understood right three months so very very interesting very good and that could be an example to to propose to the other communities european communities um, by the way i was very impressed by the red color of the of the country but uh, just you know quickly uh, it, it, greece is characterized by you know the presence of a large uh, number of islands uh, are all the islands also red zones because of precaution or because they have real cases no they have real cases unfortunately they have real cases we are not we were not careful at all after the first lockdown <laughs> okay we are not careful so thank you very much and uh, and again and i ask kindly dr dos santos uh, the next uh, speaker uh, from spain uh, to uh, give the presentation yeah just preparing the presentation thank you dr Santos. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joao Pedro Vieira. I am a first year pediatric, pediatrics resident from Spain, uh, currently doing my residency in Madrid. And I'm here to talk about the pandemic effects on pediatric residency in Spain. In 2011, the International Health Regulations Committee uh, said that the world was ill prepared to respond to any severe pandemic. In that case, it was influenza, and it still is true in 2011 as it is right now. So in today, in March 2021, after uh, more than one year since the first SARS-CoV-2 case was reported, and the year of confinement with massive disruptions at all levels, uh, there's been profound effects on pediatric work and residency, also due to work shutdown, care center adaptation, and work relocation. COVID-19 in Spain was a particular case highlighted by four main facts. The first of all was a very unexpected and very lethal instance for first wave a high death rate, especially due to, to lack of uh, proper facilities and proper oxygenation ventilation support. Uh, it actually, actually reached seventh place in, in COVID deaths per capita worldwide, major disruption of critical systems and slower start to, init to initiate healthcare restrictions in relation to countries like Italy. We're all used to seeing these kind of headlines uh, monopolize all media attention for this last year. And we're going on going on, questions to reflect on why this happened. The first index case in Spain was seen in Dial of La Gomera in the Canary Islands on the 31st of January, presumably a German tourist who had uh, allegedly uh, had contact with an infected patient in his home country. Uh, once, once the Ministry of Health uh, made this communication by VI Twitter, uh, all, all media exploded and uh, panic, general panic was set in. The number of total patients up to February has been the official number is 2.93 million, although the estimated figures uh, due to reporting cases is around 3 million figures. The data was started collecting on the 13th of April, and there's been two changes in definition cases, which uh, difficulted uh, the exact comparison with the other EU countries. Uh, the last one was until the 12th of November, which actually included the antigen tests, because the early antigen tests we had weren't uh, strict, uh, they had reliability, reliability issues. This is more or less a graph of how the evolution has gone in reporting cases with the last with this last third wave having the highest number of reported cases per day and with the total number of, of cases of 2.93 million and the total number of official deaths around 40,000. However, we've uh, uh, we've uh, we had difficulties with antigen reporting, especially during the period of summer with no correct uh, evolution after summer. There's been, however, uh, uh, a, sh a certain preoccupation with the new B117 uh, UK COVID variant, in which it's been growing. The number of cases has been growing exponentially since the, since the first reporting, and it's actually responsible responsible for one every five cases of new COVID infection at my at my hospital center. Uh, due to the massive inflow of patients, we've actually had to set up field hospitals. This was one uh, very famous one in Madrid, in which the exposition pavilion was turned into a field hospital uh, that housed around 5,000 patients. Uh, privacy was obviously an issue, although the administration did what it could to, to help protect, protect patient privacy, and at least uh, it was it was a supplemental measure to, in order to decrease patient fatality. The number to, the total the total number of deaths has a mismatch of data between the Ministry of Health and the calculated excess rate, uh, mortality rate, in which the Ministry of Health says it's around forty thousand, and uh, external estimates are estimated around uh, 70,000 70, cases. 
uh, fatality rate was similar to EU average. However, we did experience a higher fatality rate in the first wave due to a lack of open facilities with appropriate uh, respiratory support, especially oxygen supply ventilation. This was a scenario in hospitals during the first wave in which uh, patients were left in, in corridors and cared for in corridors because we simply just didn't have enough space in, in hospital rooms. Uh, number of, the number of deaths in the first wave, especially the German, is significant compared to the European Union. However, during the rest of the wave, for the rest of the waves, it uh, more or less leveled out, uh, with the number of cases being more similar to what was experienced in the rest of the EU countries. We also had a higher fatality rate at the beginning, uh, as uh, not only due to the lack of open facilities, but also due to the, an elderly population we had in Spain, around 20%, 20 of the population having more than 65 years old. We've officially had 120,000 infected healthcare workers. I haven't had, I haven't been able to find statistics for individual nurses and other, and other doctors and other healthcare workers. We did, we did have, unfortunately, 107 deceased physicians as of February 2021, uh, and most of these deaths were occurred due to lack of individual protection. So due to this lack of individual protection during the first wave, everyone equipped with whatever they, whatever they could, which was mainly uh, garbage rubbish bags, which led to a wide variety of fashion statements between hospitals, as you can see here. And about government precautions, uh, the logistics of this was uh, rather complicated since Spain is divided into 17 autonomous communities and they all share confinement authority with the central government, which meant that there was a very uncoordinated response between communities. Uh, there was also difficult adaptation to social distancing, face stress and confinement. And on a positive highlight, however, there was a slow and gradual release from confinement, which actually helped stall the second wave and prepare with ICU vacation. Uh, the phases in, in Spain were divided into three phases with a change in every three weeks, theoretically, from a very strict confinement with restaurant closing, school closing, uh, and uh, restriction of, mo of citizen mobility, uh, unless for a justified reason, and with a gradual release from, from all these measures until the until the phase three. However, due to different epidemi epidemiologic settings uh, between every autonomous community, uh, citizens have had to check the map every three days to see what, what the status of their autonomous community was, see if anything had changed. Uh, at the point that it was so uh, random to change this from one week to another, the government issued a, a new normalcy uh, statement in which uh, uh, citizens had to adapt to changing environments every couple, every couple of days, every couple of weeks. Uh, and this was a new norm for, for Madrid and for Spain for the last, uh, for the last few months. Uh, this is an example of one of those uh, confinement uh, measures proposed in which uh, elderly people were issued at certain times of day that which they could go out and walk in order to reduce risk of COVID contagion. This is a running gag in Spain during to these confinement measures uh, in which uh, when asked about uh, how to describe a summary of the 2020 the confinement protocol, uh, it's clearly a trick question and everyone's going to feel that because it was so complicated. Treatment for pediatric patients depended on updated reports received. Uh, the first wave medication mainly consists of antipyretics, fluid resuscitation, and respiratory support, uh, with steroid, heparin, aspirin on case by case basis, depending on the dimer and other results. Rodemzivir doesn't have uh, doesn't have a lot of uh, hasn't had a lot of use for pediatrics in Spain. However, clinical trials going on on with the Caravan trial uh, suggest a preliminary results that it shortens disease in four days, but only for uh, oxygen uh, oxygen needed patients. Uh, for the most of the cases, they were symptomatic and didn't even need hospitalization. Although the first official national pediatrics protocol was only released in June 2020, so there's been a little limited amount of data for COVID patients, for COVID pediatric patients. In the case of secondary bacterial infection, we mostly use amoxicillin, clavulanic acid, or ciprioxone, but uh, so over infection wasn't common in pediatric patients. And for the Sims pet case, uh, we usually associated for the true Kawasaki like Sims pet cases, we associated uh, IV immunoglobulin and with an optional use of methylprednisolone if the clinical situation demanded it. For the vaccines, we initially used the uh, Pfizer BioNTech uh, vaccines, although they had supply chain difficulties. So once the EU allowed the administration of the Moderna NIID and the AstraZeneca vaccines, uh, vaccination ensued. We currently have around 2.6% of Spanish population has received both doses of vaccine and another 3% having received a single dose. So we're on our way and fortunately most of the vaccines distributed have been actually have been actually administered. So we are more or less around the EU standard for, for vaccination. Uh, every With every day, with every passing day, a few percentage going, a few percent points going up. At my hospital specifically, we've only had eight hospitalized uh, PCR COVID positive patients, one of them being in Newborn, which is actually surprising, which uh, since we've had several mothers with positive PCR, which haven't, haven't infected their, their young ones. 
uh, and of these eight cases, four of them were since pet cases. One of them was actually covered by adult, both adult, adult services and pediatric services. Um, there was a 98 to 90 in the emergency room setting. It was a 98, 99 percent negative test result in the antigen swab tests. So we aren't seeing we aren't seeing a lot of COVID patients in pediatrics. Uh, this is the this is my hospital, the place I work at. Uh, as you can see, it's a very large hospital for being a peripheric hospital. And even though we haven't had a lot of pediatric COVID nineteen cases, and fortunately, though, even though it was one of the wor hospitals worst affected in the beginning of the pandemic, it's the rate has gradually lulled down, and it's given way to larger hospitals in order to uh, um, uh, send patients to hospitals with larger ICU occupation. For the workup handling, everything, every room, both ER, surgical facilities, and ICUs were divided in COVID-free and COVID-liable areas, uh, and healthcare workers alternated every two hours uh, in order to give some breathing room uh, and rest uh, and, and rest for the, for, the, for the workers. General sur surgical facilities were divided into fast track and observation areas, with elective surgeries being cancelled uh, during the postponing months to give space for for COVID wards. And pediatrics was greatly reduced due to lack of patient inflow. Uh, and resident and specialty, specialty pediatricians helped with administrative, IT, family contact, and communication tests. The work schedule didn't mainly change, although uh, residents and specialists uh, helping with ICU's COVID liable facilities could see their work schedule extend about an hour, an hour and a half. However, primary care pediatricians were asked to stay during Saturdays to help with family contact and COVID exposure tracing, as well as shortening clinical station time. Uh, unfortunately, despite strikes and by primary care physicians and medical residents, no hazard pay has actually been given yet, as of yet. However, new personnel was hired with uh, six month, one year contracts to help with uh, with the patient overflow we've had. Uh, pay wasn't uh, absolutely marvelous for for Spanish standard, but uh, at least at least at least around a uh, thousand doctors, five thousand nurses, and three thousand other workers were hired in this time. Uh, this included, due to the shortage of, of, of people during the during the pandemic, it actually included residency candidates, as in people who hadn't initially started residency, for triage initial workup. Um, the curriculum mostly didn't change in topic-wise in the pandemic. However, residency-mandated rotations were interrupted due to COVID, mostly to work shutdown and to clearance for how to help COVID patients, and with uh, residents and specialists uh, assisting other specialties. Uh, there's also been a sharp decrease in pediatric epidemic infected diseases, which has unfortunately slowed down clinical experience in Quarrel. With COVID infections in physicians, uh, difficulty in uh, the, night, the night shift organization and actually increasing the average number of night shifts per physician. Uh, there's also been a form of delay in the new residents incorporation. Uh, we only joined in around September, which meant that pediatric wards and emergency rooms were one, one in three men down uh, for, the, for the most duration uh, during the first wave pandemic. Fortunately, however, there's been a very strong supplementation by online resources, such as the uh, such as the two main uh, pediatric associations uh, in Spain, and this has been invaluable in order to further our pediatric training as residents. And most of the pediatric patients were 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 funneled into two of the main hospitals. For example, in Madrid, uh, they were funneled into Hospital La Paz, Hospital de Octubre, which are the main pediatric hospitals for for Madrid. As a conclusion, uh, I'd like to say that even though COVID-19 incidence is decreasing, the, the Spain's IC occupation remains quite high, so we must remain vigilant. vigilant. And in terms of pediatric residency, even it has been in, severely infected by COVID-19, and pediatric residents should strive to maximize clinical experience and recover clinical rotations within availability. The use of digital, digital assets to supplement pediatrics training it has been invaluable uh, with online training courses, society meetings, and should be maximized during these next few years of pediatric residency in order to make up for lost time. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And uh, very interesting your uh, closing statement uh, about uh, the importance of digital means, you know, to to acquire, you know, education and uh, in, uh, in COVID and in non-COVID topics, uh, you know, very important. What we learned during this year is the usage uh, of the electronic means, including you know the mean that we are, <laughs> in fact, using uh, in this uh, in this session, uh, which probably will be implemented in the future. Thank you very much for pointing this out, and 
also, you know, was uh, was interesting. You know, your observation uh, that there is a good, there are good news and bad news. The good news and it's a decrease of uh, infectious diseases. The bad news is the <laughs> a decrease of experience in infectious diseases that are not, you know, visible <laughs> and uh, and practiced by 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 residents. You know, that's uh, you know the contradictions of this situation, crazy situation. So thank you very much again for your presentation, Dr. Dos Santos. And, uh, and I kindly ask uh, Dr. Postolake, uh, Anke Postolake, to and, uh, please tell me if I pronounce correctly your last name. Uh, yes, it was perfect. It was absolutely <laughs> perfect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dr. Postolake, so please uh, give us your presentation. Yes, of course. Hello, everybody. I will now share my screen. Okay, so I can see it's working. Uh, hello, everybody, esteemed Professor Mantovani, dear colleagues, dear guests, if, uh, if it is the case. My name is Anka Postolake. I'm a third year pediatrics resident based in Yash, Romania. And today I'm gonna to present you the main aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic in Romania. We're gonna talk about numbers, about challenges we faced and how we managed all the situations. So, the first case of coronavirus infection in Romania was confirmed on the 26th of February 2020 and by the end of March of the same year we had at least 200 cases per day that were confirmed. However, the situation was a little bit milder at the beginning in Romania and we recorded the highest number of cases per day only in the second wave of infections which happened basically um, in October and November of last year. Day by day, the Romanian authorities started to increase the testing capacity from 2,000 people that were tested at the beginning up to 20,000 tests per day in the second wave. And this, of course, led by mid-November to more than 300 cases that were confirmed. Uh, because there are the numbers that worry us the most. Uh, until uh, February this year, in Romania, there were about uh, 700,000 cases of people infected with the new coronavirus and almost uh, 1,800,000 people uh, that were diagnosed with the SARS-CoV-2 infection that died, unfortunately. In this chart, you can see that one month later, uh, so by the end of February 2021, we had almost 800,000 confirmed cases and almost uh, uh, 19, uh, almost 20,000 deaths. Okay, so there were many aspects that led to difficulties in, manage in the management of this pandemic. And uh, okay, on one hand, there was the fact that the hospitals in Romania were built under the former communist regime. Then. I don't know if you know, but Romania has the lowest health expenditure of all European countries in both GDP and per capita expenditure. And lastly, but not least, the fact that we are confronted with an intense phenomenon of emigration of medical personnel. So all of these factors led to inadequate medical facilities, to insufficient supplies and a huge lack of necessary equipment. Therefore, the challenges posed by the pandemic were far more important in our country. Unfortunately, the Romanian health system uh, is little trusted, but despite this, the Romanian population stayed optimistic and they showed great support and respect for the medical staff and the Ministry of Health. And they also started making masks, donating uh, medical equipment. Um, okay, but unfortunately, and despite this fact, because of the lack of the medical protection equipment, there were more than 20,000 employees. There's a, there's a mistake here, I'm sorry. Uh, so there were more than 20,000 employees within the healthcare system that were reported to be infected, which is a lot actually. Here is a chart showing you the same thing. So more than 20,000 people out of uh, a total population of Romania that counts to 20, approximately 20 million people. I'm also going to present you one of the most dramatic examples that happened at a hospital in Suceava, which is a city in the northeast of Romania, where the lack of the management along with the, the lack of uh, equipment led to an explosion of COVID-19 cases. And in consequence, the hospital and the entire city entered complete lockdown. 
Later on, as expected, maybe due to the dangerous conditions in which they were required to work, there were a lot of health workers that decided to present their resignation situation that I also um, uh, saw that happened in your countries. And out of the total number of coronavirus uh, infections in Romania, 3.2 up to 4% were re represented by the entire personnel working in the medical field. Concerning the government precautions, uh, one of the first measures that the Romanian authorities took was to, clo to close all the schools starting on the 11th of March. They prohibited public events with more than 1,000 uh, participants. Um, they applied criminal fines for those who did not comply with the requirements of the quarantine. All the flights were postponed. Uh, but one of the most important decisions was that on the 16th of March uh, of last year, um, Romania's president, Klaus Johannes, uh, signed a decree which established a state of emergency throughout uh, the country's territory, a uh, situation that lasted for two months. And since the 17th of May of last year, the, the country re-entered uh, the state of alert. Uh, also, the government started an online campaign of information, giving the citizens all the answers to their questions concerning the transmission of the virus, treatments uh, treatment available, and vaccination. Uh, and if we're talking about vaccination, you can see in the first chart that Romania is ranked as being the 15th country worldwide, according to uh, the COVID-19 vaccination, with a 3.6 percentage of uh, vaccination. And more specifically, we have more than 1 million people that already got uh, vaccinated with really mild local or general side effects. Uh, uh, of course, the, they, were got, they were vaccinated with one of the three uh, vaccines available now in our country. So we have only Pfizer, Moderna and AstraZeneca available at the moment. In our clinic, there are fortunately few patients with COVID-19 with an average of five to four children uh, that we see each month. Uh, in our hospital, uh, more specifically, there were about 700 uh, children that got infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, they were admitted to our hospital since the beginning of the pandemic, but they had um, really, really mild, mild forms or they were really asymptomatic. There was only one child who died. He was six years old and he was born with a lot of comorbidities. Uh, the measures that we took in order to prevent and to control the situation was, of course, to use medical protection equipment for all the new children, but, uh, but also for all the visits and all the positive patients. Of course, that the positive children were being isolated, depending on their evolution, there were um, isolated e either in the ICU or uh, in the simple rooms. Um, and um, of course, the fact that uh, the medical staff was vaccinated also helped a lot. Um, of course, that the residents were really affected by the situation. At the beginning, we were integrated in the team of the epidemiological screening that was being made for every patient that consulted the emergency department. So we had around three shifts per day of um, eight hours each. And they were especially compulsory for uh, the final year residents. Uh, luckily, this measure only lasted for a couple of months because the, the equipment was really, really difficult to, to stand. On the other hand, and the most important one in my view for the intern, this pandemic had a significant impact at the level of the interaction with the patients because actually we were not allowed to see the patients because of two main reason, reasons. And the first one was the lack of equipment, uh, which happened especially at the beginning of the pandemic. And then because this type of attitude was considered to be preventing the rapid spreading um, of the infection among the medical uh, personnel. Here in this uh, photo, you can see two of my colleagues that are sending a message to the Romanian population on their paper. It is written, we are at work for you, you stay at home for us. It was one of the mottos that we used during the pandemic. So of course that the patients, uh, the, the patients' parents, all the parents in Romania and all over the world, I guess, got afraid of a potential infection and they, they started not to bring their children uh, to the hospital anymore. They would rather consult through telephone or uh, video calls. So 
And consequently, the number of the admitted patients was significantly decreasing uh, since the apparition of the first case uh, in Romania. Therefore, the interns had no raw material, uh, so we had to find some other resources in order, in order not to lose the rhythm of studying. Um, luckily, um, the doctors were really supportive. They sent us online videos, they held us online conferences, they gave us books of clinical cases that helped us moving forward. Um, at the beginning, we worked in shifts, as I already told you, but now everybody uh, came back to, uh, to the regular schedule. Also, the vast majority of the interns, as the, as the pediatricians wanted to, and got vaccinated. Concerning the work hours all the time, they were the same. Uh, we worked, as I already told you, a short period of time in shifts, but now we have returned to our normal schedules. Uh, and regarding the extra payment, uh, there was just one time when the government paid us 500 euros for those who saw infected children, but now we are only paid um, extra depending on how long we are in contact with the positive patients, the COVID-19 positive patients. Finally, the curriculum was identical to the previous years. Uh, it was, except for the fact that this time our university has decided to hold classes according to a hybrid model that was basically a, a blend of face to face and online classes. Uh, and um, after having developed a buffer zone in within our hospital the residents got a chance got again the chance to to see patients after they had received the results of the COVID-19 test practically if the patient um, was positive was COVID-19 positive he got to be seen only by a pediatrician within the buffer zone but if he was negative then the patient was uh, was and is being taken to the clinic where the residents get the chance to see him, to fill in his file and to participate to the entire treating process. I would like to thank you all for your attention. I want to wish you good luck and hopefully we will meet soon with better news and a more normal life. Hold on and have a wonderful day. Thank you all again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Dr. Postolak and uh, uh, you also touch important issues uh, like the struggle with the budget and the staff uh, reduction that uh, uh, all the but, but throughout Europe we see many countries uh, due to the restriction in uh, in budgets uh, and in financial financial uh, uh, support to to the healthcare facilities which uh, were not uh, related to COVID but you know dated back in the years and uh, uh, we saw how much was a disgrace this type of approach by the governments throughout Europe so uh, regardless for the political color of the governments they all had this type of approach of uh, reducing the budget in healthcare and now we pay the consequences and uh, and uh, uh, also thank you finally for for introducing the the topic of uh, declining of in-person visits, you know, in the ambulatory, in the private practice, we saw this phenomenon, and uh, it would be important to uh, uh, to address it and understand how to uh, to confront this uh, this uh, this challenge and by which means. So, thank you very much for having introduced this uh, uh, also this issue in your presentation. And uh, and uh, I at this point, I guess that I would like to involve Dr. Meric, Ruya Meric, because we are we are arrive at the end of the um, at the end of the list of presentation, list of speakers, and uh, is the time for uh, collecting uh, questions and uh, uh, for the speakers and uh, answering to the possible questions that will be posed. So thank you again, and uh, please, uh, Dr. Meric, Ruya, if you want, uh, if you would like to join me. And, Thank you, uh, Professor Massimo. Uh, we have, I think, two questions. Uh, first, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Gavin Stone. Uh, so our question is, do you think pediatric residents entering residency since the beginning of the pandemic will have a different training experience? Um, yeah, I, I think they're going to have a completely different experience. Um, I was talking to a first year paediatric resident um, who's working in the same hospital as me here in Dublin last week. And she said she's never seen a case of bronchiolitis, um, which I, I found completely mad. Um, there hasn't been any gastroenteritis um, 
I suppose the cases that have come through the pediatric emergency department, we've a lot less traffic than what we normally have, but they're a lot higher complexity. So I think there's a lot of, um, it's a significantly changed experience um, compared to what I went through um, when I was in my first and second year of pediatric residency. Um, I think there's been a lot of other impacts as well. Like there's a lot less opportunity to meet your colleagues. You can't sit down and have a cup of coffee. Um, I suppose you're worried about infecting and wiping out other teams in the hospital um, and you don't want that stress in your conscience. Um, so I think there's a lot more stress that's going around. And I think a lot of people have a lot, le a lot less outlets in order to be able to deal with it, especially they're worried about going home and meeting friends and family and I suppose chatting about their day um, and getting things off their chest that way. Um, I, I think it's also impacted training a lot. Um, I suppose in Ireland, we'd have uh, study days maybe once a month and everybody comes up to Dublin and we all go out afterwards and you get to know people and you know you, you get to know what's going on in Galway, what's going on in Cork and all different cities. Um, and that's just a bit lost at the moment, you know. And I think collegiality, I suppose, has suffered as a consequence of that, as a consequence of stress. Um, and I think there's been big efforts made, but I think the the balance of the stress versus the collegiality efforts, uh, I, I suppose it, it's, it's a they're difficult thing to reconcile. Okay. Thank you for the answer. And uh, for the second question, I would like to ask Dr. Anika Manka, uh, how do you think uh, parental anxiety due to COVID affected children? Well, parental anxiety uh, affected children very much in mm -hmm. many ways, in fact. Um, we saw in the last few months that uh, all children, especially the little ones, have split sleep problems. Uh, they manifested a lot of anxiety. Um, the, the bigger one have also um, alimentary problems and uh, health problems. Uh, we, we saw a lot of uh, hospitalization for these, uh, uh, for these cases. Um, in addition to that, uh, uh, we also had problems with uh, the routinary vaccinations. In fact, uh, uh, due to the fear of uh, encountering and then contracting the viruses, the, virus, uh, the, the parents uh, did not uh, um, perform the vaccinations to their children. And also the system was not organized uh, to, uh, for the administration of the vaccine to children. So there was a delay in both ways, mm -hmm. in both directions. Um, most of all, the, uh, the fear that we are continuing seeing uh, um, is to, to enter the hospitals. Uh, they are afraid to bring uh, their children to the hospitals. Um, and this um, uh, is very dangerous because it leads the, the, the parents to bring the children to our attention where when they are severely ill, so their condition is very uh, complex, uh, as Gaby told uh, also a few seconds ago. Yeah. And uh, the complexity is uh, higher than before. Um, and this reflects uh, the, the, the fear of parents uh, to enter, co uh, enter the hospitals or uh, to have contacts with doctors or uh, um, other uh, patients or other children too. This is it now. Thank you for the answer. I think this is all the questions that we have. And uh, Dr. Stone, would you like to add something for our last words? Ah, the microphone, you should uh, uh, activate Kevin, it. I think your microphone is off. Apologies. Um, I, I'd really like to thank all the speakers today. We've heard some fantastic presentations. Um, I think the presentations have really shown the, the valiant efforts made by pediatricians across Europe and Russia in the war effort against COVID-19. Um, I think the pandemic has really made us rethink how we conduct our work and our training. Um, and I really think it's made us think a lot more about how we support each other um, in terms of 
decreasing work-related stress and burnout and just supporting our colleagues. Um, I suppose I'm going to use that segue to promote our um, next session at Europediatrics um, in October. Um, I suppose where we're going to be discussing this topic and we really hope that everybody here will be able to join us. Um, I suppose with that, I'd like to hand back the floor to Professor Mantovani um, and I'd like to thank him for chairing our session. Uh, thank, thank you very you much. Thank you very much, Gavin, and thank you very much to all the group of Euro, uh, the Europa guys and colleagues. Uh, it's uh, your, in, your initiative to, to pull together uh, the young generation of pediatrician pulling together. It's uh, very important because that will be the future, you know. It's, uh, and uh, uh, we, are, we, are, we are confident that now we can pass hands to to a, a very good group of uh, very competent colleagues. And uh, this is very reassuring. And uh, I really like to see you in, uh, in uh, Zagreb for the, for the meeting in October. Hopefully, you know, I know it's a mixed uh, 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 hybrid uh, type of meeting, but uh, I hope to be there uh, in, uh, in person and see you in person. Uh, lastly, I just would like to uh, to note that your your point of uh, you know among the points that we are discussing in, in this session were the 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 fact that we we saw a decrease in uh, experience in other uh, diseases, particularly infectious diseases. And uh, if you would like to uh, to uh, to read uh, some comment on uh, on this point. Uh, uh, I think there is a commentary uh, that was recently published by the French colleagues, uh, the group, the French group of uh, Corinne Levy and Robert Cohen uh, on the uh, journal of pediatrics. I think at the beginning of this year, and there's a free access, so it's a, it's a commentary that adds uh, some some comment uh, on this point uh, and how particularly resources were redirected to COVID. And subtracted to other to other issues, uh, uh, infectious diseases or disease issues. So I think it would be useful uh, a, a useful reading. So I suggest you to go to the Journal of Pediatrics and uh, look for the commentaries of Corinne Levy. So thank you very much to all for your interesting initiative and for uh, inviting me to chair. Thank you.